I'd like to thank Jewish Gen, uh, Jewish, Jewish Genealogy Society of New York and the Leo Beck Institute for sponsoring this session. Begins with Alexandra Suskind Bernstein, my great 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 grandfather from Posen, whose portrait hung over our fireplace when I was growing up and who now hangs over my desk where I'm speaking to you. There were supposedly 13 identical portraits painted in about 1840, one for each of Alexander's children, but I had never been able to find any of the others. It was almost 50 years ago when I became interested in my family history. I was rummaging through a giant trunk of correspondence with my father and found a 1939 letter from Albert Einstein to my grandmother requesting that she provide an affidavit for her cousin, Alice Bernstein. I had no idea who Alice Bernstein was, nor did my father. Some years later, I corresponded with the Albert Einstein archives at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. They had a file for Alice, but it was from many different sources, including letters they bought at auction. It was helpful, but it did not provide a complete story. Uh, a letter from Einstein to the American Consul in London, for example, indicated that he knew Alice personally. More information was to be found in when I sent for and received a 32-page A file, an alien file, from the United States Customs and Immigration Service with details about her immigration. She was in England during the war. Her life when she arrived in the United States must have been very difficult. She spent the first nine months at age 60 working in a vitamin store, a dry cleaner, and a refrigerator company. Alice settled in Chicago. Why Chicago? I got a clue from a result of a DNA test several years ago. A person who matched me on Family Tree DNA wrote me, my DNA test shows you as my closest relative. My name is Rita Brief. My grandfather is Milton Bernstein, and my mother believes that's the connection. I knew it was, as Milton's father had met my father at the pier upon his arrival in the United States in the 1930s, according to a letter my then eight-year-old father had written. Our families had lost touch after my grandmother's death in 1961. The Bernsteins, it seems, had moved to Chicago. Rita wrote me that she had a copy of the portrait. And now I realize that Alice Bernstein might have moved to Chicago, at least in part, because she had Bernstein cousins there. Shortly after I received Rita's message, I learned of a third portrait owned by Jane uh, Grau, who had seen my copy of the book, of the painting in Edvard Luft's book on researching Jews from Posen. This talk has many dimensions. It includes the most general discussion of issues related to entry in the United States prior to the Holocaust, describes some of the processes, and touches on refugees to countries throughout the world. Using specific examples to show how research can be done, it's not meant to be comprehensive, but a handout will be made available uh, at the end of the session. The families and their stories I will share today could not have been researched without the assistance of dozens of colleagues friends, archivists, and experts. The assistance of my colleagues uh, were crucial to helping understand the situation that the refugees faced in the many places that they went to. The talk will include um, a little bit about how difficult it was to, for people to bring people to the United States, as well as the experiences of the refugees themselves in the process. Several years ago, an exhibition at the Museum of Jewish Heritage here in New York City dealt with this exact topic. It's called Against the Odds, and the concept of the exhibition, as you can see from this photograph, was that the wall between Europe and the United States was a wall of paper. That is, um, one could not get across unless one had accomplished a tremendous amount to uh, prepare all of the required documents in order to uh, come. And this was particularly difficult because of the difficulties put forth by the Ameri American government. As you can see from this slide, 67% of the country and 30% and more to some degree 
did not want refugees in their country. This talk will focus, uh, at least in part, on the Meyer Lehman Charity Fund and the efforts of the Lehman family to bring over not only their relatives, but also many hundreds of other people to the United States uh, to bring them over and to support them in ways that were necessary uh, when they arrived. The story starts in Rimpard, Germany. And I'm sure you probably know the story of the Lehman Brothers, the founders of the company that in 2008 went bankrupt, causing the world financial crisis that year. Uh, Meyer Lehman and his two brothers founded Lehman Brothers, uh, which began in cotton and continued in investments. Um, you may, rec may recognize their old building, but may be more familiar with their last quarters in New York City, uh, which of course um, ended in 2008. Now I became part of this project uh, it, when I did an exhibition at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, guest curated The Morgenthau's A Legacy of Service. It was a story of three generations of Henry Morgenthau Sr., who was ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, his son Henry Jr., who was Secretary of the Treasury during the Roosevelt administration and the Second World War, Robert Morgenthau, their son, who uh, was the District Attorney of New York City for over 34 years. And while I was working on that project, Henry Morgenthau Jr.'s daughter, Joan Morgenthau Hirschhorn, uh, came to me with a document that they had the fourth report of the Meyer Lehman Charity Fund was a family foundation to support the refugees. We knew very little about it, and I promised her that when the exhibition was over, I would do more research, and so I did. And in the Columbia University Library's Herbert H. Lehman Special Collection, there's a series of documentation for many of the people who they assisted, and also a fundraising letter that explains the fund that they requested money from, from all the cousins, uh, to assist these people. And this was in 1938, just after Kristallnacht, when they wrote that, in fact, they had already given a number of affidavits. Now, of those who they were yet unable to help, whom they had already provided affidavits to, but were still in Europe, 39 in number in 1942, there were 30 two that were living in occupied territories, uh, territories, Germany, France, Holland, Poland. And at that time, in the end, um, three of them uh, did not perish. One who did die was actually a first cousin of Governor Herbert Lehman, Ava Lehman Talheimer. Now, Herbert Lehman himself uh, was, uh, became governor in 1933. He was well known as a Jew, uh, Jewish governor and a great philanthropist and humanitarian. And many people reached out to him, claiming that they were relatives uh, requesting assistance at that time. He asked his niece, Dorothy Bernard, if she would lead the efforts on behalf of the family. And she did so for many years till her death in 1969. It was an extraordinary story of a wealthy woman who donated her time and all her efforts uh, in this regard. She was assisted by Herbert Lehman's secretary or his administrative assistant, or his assistant, Carolyn Flexner, uh, a wonderful and uh, woman who also devoted her life to these causes, unknown in history, and in fact, I had to go to great lengths even to just find a photograph of her. She and Dorothy Bernard uh, put this together, and let's begin with the fourth report of the Meyer Lehman Charity Fund. Uh, when I put, tried to put this together, I was reminded of a story, I could not remember the details, of a man who was imprisoned in Dutch Guiana, what is today Suriname. I knew there was a connection to art dealers, but I could not remember the name of the family. Now, I knew that the Lehmans had helped Didier Aron, a very famous art dealer, and I looked in that file of the hundreds in my basement. He was not among them, and I could not remember the name until uh, my husband's brother recommended that we watch The Spy on Netflix. And sure enough, I took one look at one of the main characters in the cast and I knew exactly which family it was. It was Noah Emmerich was the um, actor and the family was that of the art dealer, Andre Emmerich, 
And the story was about his father, Hugo Emmerich, who, um, who's, who was assisted by his wife. Now, many people wrote to Herbert Lehman saying they were related somehow, but Lily Emmerich had a different story. She wrote the governor about when they were children vacationing in the same hotel in Switzerland, and she had met him but never seen him. She gave him French lessons from behind the door of their uh, various hotel rooms. And eventually they told their parents and the parents realized that the families knew each other. And she used this to then ask for assistance for her husband, uh, who was at the time uh, in 1940 in uh, Dutch Guiana. Now we know from this story that, uh, and from the letters, that the Emmerich family had been living in Germany, had fled to Holland in 1933. Uh, Emmerich was about to get, Hugo Emmerich was about to get his Dutch citizenship, but after Kristallnacht, he feared uh, for his, his life and the situation, and they went to Dutch Guiana. From there, his wife and children came to the United States on a French passport, but he was imprisoned because they thought that he could have been a spy. And he needed assistance to get to the United States, and he wrote to Herbert Lehman. Now, I would love to know more about what happened to him. There were only um, under 100 uh, prisoners like this in Dutch Guiana. He was not in prison because he was Jewish, but because of fear of his political activities. Right now, is COVID-19, it'd be a little difficult to reach the archives down there, but I'm looking for assistance from anyone who might be able to help me understand what was going on in this story. Emmer came to the United States uh, with the assistance of Herbert Lehman and died in 1961. Max Neugas, a, another relative of the Lehmans, wrote to Herbert Lehman in 1940 that he had left Germany in 1938 to go to France uh, to work against the, uh, the Nazis, but unfortunately he was imprisoned. And he writes to uh, Carolyn Flexner, and, who wrote to Dorothy Bernard, telling her about a woman, Selma Stern, who had come to him to help her brother outside. At, at that time, he was in a camp outside of Casablanca. Now, how, how did Max Neugas, who we just knew was in France, how did he get to Morocco, to Casablanca at that time? Well, we know physically how he got there, that there were a number of ships that uh, left Vichy, France and stopped in Morocco. Uh, and we assume that he um, got there on one of these ships. We know a little bit more detail because of a collection from the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People, also a copy at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And here again, I wanna thank uh, my colleague, Philip Traurig, who as a volunteer went to this collection at the, center, at the um, Central Archives and found this identity card for Max Neugas, uh, in, uh, born in Lohr in Germany, and it has the address where he was living in Casablanca and other important information. We know from a letter in 1941 a little bit more about Max's story. Uh, it seems that he ha actually had escaped from the camp in France, but we don't know exactly how, um, that he was in Morocco for 10 months. And then what happened to him? We learned from the Joint Distribution Committee uh, archives, the JDC, uh, we found there, and by the way, we did not go on their wonderful website. There was nothing available, but we actually had to go to the archive itself in Midtown Manhattan to find a ship record for Max Neugas. We know it's the right one because there's the sister Selma Stern uh, on that passenger record too. Uh, they were, they set out uh, this ship, the Winnipeg, um, from that list. We learned about it from a book. There's very little information about this chapter in the history of refugees uh, that left Marseille in Vichy, France, uh, stopped in Casablanca and was headed to Martinique in 1941, in June of 1941. Now, uh, Martinique was a, also a, a Vichy territory. And what happened next? was that the ship was intercepted by a Dutch warship 
on the high seas on its way to Martinique. And then the passengers who they thought might be spies were, it, were woken up in the middle of the night and interrogated. And one can only imagine what it must have been for Max Neugas after his camp, uh, after he was in a camp in France and a camp and got, escaped, got to Casablanca, got on the ship and then was interrogated on his way and dropped off actually in Trinidad. Now from Trinidad, there were a, a number of refugees who got on a boat and went to New York. But for some reason that we've not yet found out, Max flew from Trinidad to San Juan to Miami. And we were able to find his passenger record on ancestry.com and there he is on the bottom line. Uh, you can see with just a few other passengers, he made this flight. And a landing card also from Ancestry.com uh, identifies him as he arrived in the United States. Now, of course, one of the best ways we might have gotten additional information is from descendants. But in this case, Max had no children. So we looked for the children of his sister, Selma Stern, and we found the grandchildren, but sadly, they knew nothing about Max Neugas, only his name. But in this case, I was able to give them information because I read to them the letter that had been written to Dorothy Bernard by Carolyn Flexner that said, uh, the nicest of the Lehmans I have met is Mrs. Julius Stern, their grandmother. The Bodekheimer family. Many of us, of course, uh, go early in our research uh, to Yad Vashem. And it, we found on Yad Vashem of that list of the 39 uh, left in Europe, there was a family of Bodekheimers, uh, father, mother, and son. And the son, Bernd Bodekheimer, and his parents were all on a page of testimony from Yad Vashem. Uh, they died in Gurs. And I knew a little bit more because there was correspondence uh, that it, it was required in 1941, if one still had a, a affidavit application pending, the entire system was required to apply again, just one of the steps to make it very difficult for refugees at the time. And during that process, you can see that um, they had to list the address and the address was already in a camp. Uh, results in in France in, at that time. Now, Dorothy Bernard wrote in a, a letter that for over three years she'd been trying to bring the family to this country. And the papers are at the Center for Jewish History in the highest collection, and one can write to the archivist at um, Evo uh, to get this record. This is what the one for the Bodekheimers looked like. Must have been at least an inch thick uh, that really described and documents that work that Dorothy Bernard did for three years. But that work was in, in vain because Gunter Bodegheimer, uh, a record that I got from the Memorial de la Shoah, shows that he went from Gours to Rivesalt, from there to Leigny, and then uh, from the United States at that time, the final decision not to issue a visa was made on August 13th, 1942. But we know from the Memorial de la Shoah that on the next day, as it happened, he was deported to Auschwitz. However, the Jewish Gen Holocaust database, uh, which has an amalgam of many interesting and unusual uh, documents, databases, showed Bernd Bodenheimer, the son, uh, in an orphanage. He did not die in Gores, he was in an orphanage in France. And this is the a photo of the orphanage where he lived during the war years. And in fact, he did survive. And here's a photograph of his wedding. And one of the reasons I love uh, this story so much are the personal stories <clears throat> that come with it. We learned from Bernie that um, the family did not have a lot of money when they came to this country. He was bar mitzvah soon after he arrived and among the few gifts he received were three wallets about which he always said they were the worst gifts he had ever received. 
because he had no money to put in them. And another story I was told about Bernie from a cousin, not a Lehman cousin, but a cousin from the other side of his family, was that they remember when he arrived at the pier in New York in January wearing shorts. And uh, of course, we know now that that was because he must have waited at the port to get a ship to come to the United States for many months before he was successful in coming. His mother, uh, who found him in the orphanage after the war, having been in hiding for much of that time, died in New Jersey at the age of 100. Now, another family that uh, we worked on was the Seaman family from Ashbach. And here is just a portion of a typical letter that was written to the Lehmans requesting assistance. And if you look at the last line, he's, it, uh, it says, my late grandmother, and you know the rest of it, was a Lehman. Now, in this case, these uh, cousins of, of the Lehmans had gone to Brazil before the war, but there was a sister left in Germany and a brother who had, um, oh, and I, I should say first, um, some in, uh, there was a brother who had gone to Santo Domingo, to the Dominican Republic. Now, in looking to see how they were related, I was able to look through the records of the Leo Beck Institute. Leo Beck Institute has wonderful community collections for many communities in Germany. There are memoirs, um, at books, all kinds of personal records, family trees, and in this case, for the Seaman family from Aschbach to determine the connection, I found just a general community history. And it seems that Jakob Seaman, the father of Bertha Seaman who wrote the letter, was the last surviving Jew in the town of Aschbach. He died in 1942. And all of the Leo Beck Institute records, 90% of the archival records are digitized and online at lbi.org. Now, the brother, uh, Luis, who went to Santo Domingo, it's an unusual story because many of us know of the story of Sosua, uh, a place where refugees were, were welcomed in, in the unlikely Dominican Republic. Um, and there were five, about 500 of them. But the part of the story I did not know until I did this research was that there were an equal number of individuals who lived in the city in Santo Domingo, which was it then Ciudad Trujillo. Uh, and that was the case with Bertha's brother. Uh, he was there for 10 years before he was able to get to Brazil. And this record is from familysearch.org. And Family Search has other Brazilian records. This one is um, an alien file, and it's for Bertha's daughter, Frida, and who was born in 1921. And we are looking for any record of her or her children. So that's ongoing. We also learned from a website in Germany, a series of websites about little towns called Alemane Judaica that there is a breastplate of the Seaman family from Ashbach that is in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And we are following that up as well. This is another story, a uh, family I worked with in Washington, DC. It's the story of a brother and sister, um, Henry Leibel and Mitzi Wertheimer. Uh, they were successful in bringing over over 20 family members uh, to the United States. And actually we learned, we didn't even know how they were related either. Some of them, uh, some of the st family stories had been lost and we used JRI Poland, uh, a, a wonderful database to figure out how all these people were related. But um, Mitzi uh, Wertheimer, Mitzi uh, Wertheim, her husband Albert, uh, had come to this country with her in 1923 was unhappy here, left and went back to Europe. Uh, their daughter, uh, granddaughter Sandy found that Albert had been murdered in the Holocaust, but she knew nothing about his family. It seems that Albert was 40 years old when he married Mitzi, and Sandy assumed he might have had a first wife and children. She knew he had siblings, but was unaware of what happened to any of them. The only thing she knew that was that Albert's father was Ignatz. And from that little bit of information, uh, we were able to find a tree on my heritage that shows Ignatz 
uh, that the family was from Croatia and that Albert was one of five siblings. And there is just a bit of information on my heritage. Now, usually one would write to the owner of the tree to get more information, but in this case, uh, it wasn't possible. But we can see from the chart that uh, Albert did have a brother, Bernhard, who was murdered. And in fact, uh, and we don't know what happened to the others. In fact, he also had a daughter by his first marriage who was murdered. Now, um, we'd like to know if there are any descendants of the other four siblings, but there's not a lot of information uh, about Holocaust uh, victims in Croatia. And if they, there were survivors among the family, they might have come to, gone to Israel, as many did from Croatia. And so the next step will be to go to the Israel Genealogy Research Association website, where there are um, multiple databases that might give us some additional information. And uh, I uh, end or get close to ending with the story of Adolf Baer, also a Lehman cousin, um, who had taken the route to go to Palestine before the war and from there eventually uh, to South America, then to the United States, uh, various branches of the family. But I found, uh, I promised you all that I would show a document, something from Egypt as well, um, talk about that route. And in fact, Albert Baer went through and his family went through Alexandria, Egypt on their way to Palestine. Now I knew a lot of this story because from my basement, because it seems that at, that um, Adolf Baer married a cousin in my family and I had been in contact with that cousin inquiring about the family story already almost 40 years ago. So I only had to go down to my basement to find out what happened to the Baer family. Now the almost final, final story has to do with four sisters. This is also for uh, the story of, of Henry Leibel and Mitzi. This is Henry's mother, uh, Paula Gottlieb Leibel. She was one uh, of a large family and two of the oldest sisters and a brother moved to Philadelphia in the 1880s and 1890s. Paula remained in Europe and was able to come out uh, shortly uh, in uh, shortly after the Anschluss in 1938 uh, from Vienna. And at the time that she came uh, to meet her cousin, her siblings who she hadn't seen in many years, there was a newspaper article. And surprised we were to find a second newspaper from when the youngest sister came to the United States in, in 1946. Uh, four sisters reunited after 58 years. The math may be a little off, but the story is incredible uh, in terms of immigration, makes one think most widely about the possibilities and also um, to have this from a newspaper, yet another uh, place where uh, we can learn, where we can learn about our uh, refugee family. Now, finally, I could use your help, in fact, uh, with these families uh, to explore them further, the same, uh, same kinds of stories you may have for your family. The best place is those, those colleagues, those friends uh, that, that, help, uh, that help one. So if you happen to know anything about the descendants of Frida Mahler in Brazil, I would welcome your help. And um, I should also add, that uh, we will make available a sheet uh, back um, available at the end of this lecture uh, that has information about many of the archives and databases that we've discussed so far, and that will have a, a place to send me any information that you might have to, to help me out, and I will be happy to help you out also. Um, would you happen to know the family of uh, Albert Wertheim, his son Kurt and uh, his, this, his siblings, half-siblings, aunts, uncles, descendants of uh, Ignaz Wertheim. Er. Information on the Dutch Guiana prison camp. I would like to know more about it. 
Uh, have you seen any portraits of Alexander Susskind Bernstein? As far as I know, there are 10 out there somewhere in the world. Perhaps you've seen one uh, in a family, in a home of someone in your family, or even a friend. Please let me know. And finally, I would love to meet Noah Emmerich. Um, so if you happen to know him, uh, please let me know. Great actor. So thank you very much uh, for, for listening, for your interest. I hope we can be helpful to you. Uh, Jewish Gen Leo Beck Institute, Jewish Genealogical Society. And thanks so much. And thank you especially to all those who made uh, this research, this program possible.